Um, just my ears peaked up there when you mentioned that um, all the social insurance benefits were extending to the self-employed. Can you confirm, if that, does that include illness benefit and will that be announced in the, current, in the next budget? Or did I hear something incorrect? Um, I heard the same. So that's something that really caught my attention. Um, there's another issue which has come up, it's, it's, it's quite a small issue, but it's come up time and time again at uh, my constituency clinics, is, is, in, is in relation to the income thresholds for the fuel allowance. I know my colleague, Deputy Brady, mentioned his um, issue with the fuel allowance, but it's just something that I think is, um, it's, 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 it's a very small adjustment that could be made, but I think it would be very meaningful for people who um, aren't, uh, eligible for the fuel allowance and obviously in various areas around the country there's ancillary benefits you receive when you are in receipt of the fuel allowance including certain health boards um, give out home insulation um, to uh, private homeowners so it is something that I'd like you to like to hear what you have to say on it. Um, another issue that some of my colleagues raised and obviously you raised in relation to the retirement age and the stop and the sort of lacuna where your people are who've been worked all their lives are signing on for a year on, on, the, on foot of a stipulation in their employment contract that they have to retire at 65. Have your department considered any legislation <coughs> to make um, a stipulation that you must retire at 65 null and void or even lesser type of legislation which would be less onerous on employers perhaps to apply like a red hand rule to those type of stipulations where an employer has to point out to an employee that listen this is the case you're going to be uh, retired at 65 and after that you know especially you know you'll have to uh, sign on and especially with the changes in the retirement ages coming down the tracks it might be something because people seem quite shocked actually that they have to sign on. I don't think they mind it, but they just can't believe they have to do it. So, but if people were knew about it before, they might be able to plan for you know the period of few years where they can't, uh, where they will be um, signing on. Because a lot of people have worked all their lives, and it's very the idea of not working is is very is, is um, very strange. So, um, another issue that I'd like to raise, and it's a small issue as well. It's just in relation to a stopgap payment. So a lot of people who have been on job seekers, they take up full employment and they're not going to be paid for perhaps a month and they're left um, sometimes with a month of no income. So if there's, I know you used to have discretional payments, uh, but I don't know, it wouldn't really apply. They're not in a bad way. They're obviously in a better position where they have full-time employment, but they're left with um, you know, income for a month. So it's just something to have a look at. And then the other issue I'd just like to raise in relation to is there going to be an increase in the old age pension? I fully agree with my colleague, um, Senator Higgins, in relation to gender pension inequality, and she's been championing this since I first met her in the Shannon. And I'd also like to just ask you if you have considered an increase in the hours that people are permitted to work while receiving um, various um, supports from your office, including family income supplement, so that they're encouraged to work and rather whilst, you know, while still receiving some of the state support.